Hello, everyone. Welcome to a press conference with Nikki Ash, an NDP national revenue critic, Don Davies, NDP health critic, advocates for international vaccine access, and the Bolivian Minister of Foreign Trade and Integration, Benjamin Blanco. Please note uh, that this press conference will be delivered in English, French, and Spanish. Please use the interpretation menu at the bottom of your page to select your preferred interpretation. Uh, and you will hear the speaker or the interpretation in that language. We recommend that you do not mute the background audio as there can be a brief lag between the interpretation and the speaker's sound if it switches to your language. If you are comfortable in more than one language, you can switch between interpretation or the, the your interpretation of choice or the original audio through the same menu. Alors, vous êtes bien à la conférence de presse de, avec la porte-parole pour le revenu et euh, la porte-parole pour le revenu national Nikki Ashton, ainsi que la porte-parole pour la santé du NPD Don Davies, des intervenantes et intervenants pour l'accès aux vaccins à l'échelle internationale, ainsi que le ministre bolivien du commerce extérieur et de l'intégration, M. Benjamin Blanco. Veuillez noter que cette conférence de presse sera donnée en anglais, français et espagnol. Au bas de votre écran, vous trouverez le menu d'interprétation. Veuillez utiliser ce menu au bas de la page pour sélectionner la langue de votre choix. Nous vous recommandons de ne pas mettre l'audio original en sourdine puisqu'il peut y avoir un délai entre l'interprétation et le son de l'orateur alors que la langue change. Si vous êtes à l'aise dans plus d'une langue, vous vous pouvez alterner entre l'interprétation de votre choix et le son original au sein du même menu. Donc, euh, je vais donner la parole maintenant à Niki qui va juste nous traduire les instructions en espagnol. Uh, quería decir que en la parte inferior de su pantalla encontrará el menú de interpretación. Puede seleccionar el idioma que prefiera, inglés, francés o español. Escuchará al intérprete del idioma que escogió. La interpretación en los tres idiomas es ofrecido como parte de esta conferencia de prensa. Les recomendamos que no silencien el audio de fondo porque podría haber un breve lapso entre la interpretación y el sonido de la persona que habla si cambia su idioma. Si se siente cómodo en más de un idioma, puede cambiar entre cada interpretación o el audio original en el mismo menú. Gracias. Thank you very much, Nikki. You can go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Nikki Ashton. I'm the NDP MP for Churchill Kiwait Nukuski, and I am pleased to host this press conference with my NDP colleague and our health critic, Don Davies, the MP for Vancouver Kingsway. Today's press conference marks the first time during the COVID-19 pandemic that a Canadian drug manufacturer, BioLease, and a country in the global south, Bolivia, are reaching out jointly to, a, to Canadian media on Parliament Hill calling for action from our government. We stand with the, them and with Canadians sharing a clear message. Our message today is that Canada must ensure that BioLease, a Canadian drug manufacturer based in St. Catharines, Ontario, can produce life-saving COVID-19 vaccines ordered and paid for by Bolivia. This means that Canada must grant the compulsory license that would enable this production to take place. Let's be clear, these vaccines will save lives. These vaccines will slow down the global spread of COVID-19. Today, you will hear from Vice Minister Blanco from Bolivia. You will hear from BioLease Representative John Fulton. You will hear from leading global voices on vaccine equity, KEI, and Luis Gil Abinader. And from the Council of Canadians, who along with other Canadian-based networks and advocacy organizations are clear. Canadians expect better from their government. Canada needs to drop the facade on the world stage that we are being benevolent when it comes to vaccines. The government of Canada is choosing to side with big pharmaceutical companies instead of finding ways to make vaccines available to the global south by producing them here in Canada. This deal between BioLease and Bolivia is good for the people of Bolivia.
It is good for Canadian workers and communities. It is good for our world. It's time for Canada to act. And I'd now like to pass the, the, uh, the mic on to my colleague, Don Davies. Well, thank you very much, Nikki, uh, and to all of uh, our distinguished uh, panelists at this news conference. It's a, a privilege to join you here today as we join together uh, in calling for something that not only is a matter of fundamental equity, but one of profound public health. When it comes to COVID-19, one thing is clear. Until everyone is safe, no one is safe. Yet, of the almost 7 billion COVID-19 vaccine doses that have been administered globally to date, just 3% have gone to people in lower income countries. Numerous countries still haven't received enough doses even to vaccinate their frontline healthcare workers. Inequitable global vaccine distribution will needlessly prolong the COVID-19 pandemic and risks incubating dangerous new variants of the virus in unvaccinated populations everywhere. That means that people will needlessly get sick and die. The OECD estimates that the global economy also stands to lose as much as $9.2 trillion if governments fail to ensure that developing economies access to COVID-19 vaccines is there. As much as half of that would fall on advanced economies as well. It's important to remember that COVID-19 vaccine research and development was primarily financed in large part through public investment. Intellectual property constraints cannot be justified in those circumstances or in a time of crisis. Instead of defending the interests of the pharmaceutical industry, the government of Canada must start working collaboratively with other countries to dismantle vaccine production barriers as rapidly as possible. We have recently called on the government of Canada to support the request of many countries such as India to waive the TRIPS barriers that are preventing countries from having access to the intellectual property and technology necessary to produce COVID vaccines. Today, I call on my colleagues and the people on this, on this uh, press conference to call on the government of Canada to approve the request of BioLease Pharma to produce vaccines destined for Bolivia. This is not only a matter of basic equity, it's one of sound public health not only to the people of Bolivia, but also to the people of Canada, because once again, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Thank you. Thank you, Don. And next we will hear from Vice Minister Blanco from Bolivia. Muchas gracias, muy buenas tardes a los diputados, a Nikki Ashton, a Don Davis, al presidente de Bioniágara y portavoz de Biolice Pharma, John Fulton, al investigador principal de Key, eh, Luis Gil, al responsable de comercio y privatización del Consejo de Canadienses, Nicolás Berrishaw, a los medios de prensa, tanto canadienses como bolivianos, y a todos los que están presentes en esta conferencia de prensa. Eh, como ustedes saben, la, la pandemia generada en el año 2019 por el covid ha dejado un escenario desolador en el mundo. Eh, tenemos una crisis sanitaria, económica, social en la humanidad y esto nos invita a una profunda re reflexión sobre el actuar del ser humano en la sociedad. Eh, según los estándares internacionales, para salir de esta crisis es necesario tener un nivel de inmunización óptimo a nivel mundial y eso quiere decir que el 70% de las personas deben estar vacunados con un esquema de vacunación completo. Eh, con países los más potentados, sobre todo las empresas farmacéuticas, han mostrado no tener la predisposición de acelerar esta meta, sembrando la lamentable idea de que la vacuna ha sido únicamente una herramienta 
para eh, satisfacer los intereses económicos de algunas empresas transnacionales. Eh, es por eso que Bolivia, partiendo de su experiencia en lo que ha sido la adquisición de vacunas para el país, ha planteado dos acciones concretas para facilitar el acceso en relación al acuerdo sobre los aspectos de derechos de propiedad intelectual. Por un lado, el tema de la liberación de patentes. Bolivia ha apoyado la propuesta de India y Sudáfrica para poder hacer una extensión de determinadas disposiciones del acuerdo sobre los ATPIC a través de lo que era la reserva de los ATPIC ante emergencias sanitarias. Esto permitiría que todos los países eh, no hagan cumplir la protección que existe de propiedad intelectual durante el tiempo que dura la pandemia hasta que se haya logrado una vacunación generalizada. Eh, el Consejo de los ATPIC de la Organización Mundial de Comercio ha debatido esta propuesta, ha tenido apoyo de decenas de países, cientos de organizaciones civiles, sin embargo, algunos países desarrollados impiden el avance y bloquean esta posibilidad argumentando que las, los mecanismos que existen ya en la OMC serían suficientes. Se refieren precisamente a las licencias obligatorias, eh, que bueno, como vamos a ver, para el caso de, de Bolivia, eh, se demuestra que este mecanismo ha fracasado. La segunda, la segunda línea de acción hemos, que hemos aplicado ha sido eh, buscar la emisión de autorizaciones voluntarias u obligatorias. Eh, ha habido una muy trabada negociación, no vemos de que en el marco de la OMC puedan haber avances y es por eso que Bolivia ha aplicado eh, los mecanismos ya existentes para poder obtener una exención temporal de patentes. En ese sentido, eh, Bolivia planteó utilizar la flexibilidad de licencias obligatorias, eh, lo que es el artículo 31 y 31 bis de los ATPIC, que contempla precisamente flexibilidades sobre la protección de las patentes y una de ellas son las licencias obligatorias, que son autorizaciones otorgadas por un gobierno para utilizar una invención patentada sin el consentimiento del titular de la patente. Estos mecanismos se han eh, diseñado precisamente para momentos de crisis como este que ha generado la pandemia. Sin embargo, llevamos ya varios meses y no hemos podido lograrlo. El artículo 31 permite condiciones para emitir esta licencia que consiste que las personas o empresas solicitantes de las licencias primero debe intentar negociar en términos comerciales una licencia voluntaria con el titular de la patente. Eh, si este camino no ha conseguido respuesta, que es el caso eh, que, que tenemos, eh, que estamos analizando el día de hoy, se podría emitir una licencia obligatoria. Bolivia para eso ha tomado contacto con KEI, que es una organización que se dedica al acceso a los medicamentos y vacunas, eh, tiene oficinas tanto en Washington como en Ginebra, y esta, el KEI colabora con la empresa canadiense BioLice Pharma, que esta empresa tiene la capacidad de fabricar alrededor de 20 millones de vacunas contra el COVID-19 por año. Concretamente, Bolivia firmó un convenio con la empresa canadiense Biolize Pharma para fabricar e importar 15 millones de dosis de vacunas que son monodosis, vacunas Johnson Johnson, siempre y cuando se consiga la licencia obligatoria. Eso nos permitiría llegar a 15 millones de personas con, eh, a, con un esquema de vacunación completo a un precio de entre 3 y 4 dólares. Posteriormente, Bolivia inició el proceso de licencia obligatoria notificando su uso como país importador y ha solicitado que Canadá, conforme a su propia legislación, notifique su intención de poder ser un país exportador, ya que Biolice Pharma tiene domicilio en Canadá, por lo cual se requiere de esta voluntad política por parte del gobierno de Canadá para poder efectivizar estas licencias obligatorias. En mayo de este año eh, se ha tenido la firma de contrato entre Bolivia y Biolice eh, y en, ese, en, esa, en esa oportunidad Anthony Taubman, director de la División de Propiedad Intelectual de la Organización Mundial del Comercio, indicó claramente que la firma de este contrato eh, proporciona una respuesta práctica de lo que podría ser un proceso más amplio en el que los países señalen necesidades urgentes e insatisfechas y fomenten una respuesta combinada y coordinada con los socios internacionales. Sin embargo, al día de hoy, y estamos en el mes de noviembre, han pasado varios meses, eh, vemos que no ha sido posible obtener por parte del gobierno de Canadá esta voluntad política que se requiere 
para poder tener estas licencias obligatorias. Eh, la experiencia de Bolivia eh, se ve que ha sido fallida, se han utilizado los mecanismos existentes, pero no se ha logrado la, la licencia obligatoria. Y en caso de lograrlo, estaríamos marcando no solamente la posibilidad de que Bolivia pueda adquirir vacunas, sino también que los demás países en desarrollo que todavía no tienen acceso a las vacunas puedan encontrar un camino para poder adquirir vacunas sin necesidad de patentes. Eh, a medida de que va pasando el tiempo, vamos lamentando mayor cantidad de pérdidas de vidas, más con la cuarta ola en todos los países del mundo y en especial en los países eh, de en desarrollo y los países menos adelantados. Esta, este mecanismo depende de la voluntad de un tercero, que en este caso no ha mostrado interés en aplicar el mecanismo y en consecuencia se ve. Pardon, je vais juste arrêter une seconde. Euh, le, monsieur le ministre, vous êtes sur mute. Ah, OK, parfait. C'est revenu maintenant. Merci. Thank you. OK, sí, mil, mil disculpas. Eh, bueno, decía de que la experiencia de Bolivia muestra que se requiere de la voluntad de un tercero que no ha demostrado interés en aplicar el mecanismo y en consecuencia se verifica que los estándares internacionales no están, no responden a las necesidades y a la emergencia que tienen nuestros pueblos. Eh, no están, no son oportunos, es decir, desde mayo hasta hoy no hemos podido tener respuestas y esto significa que los países en especial, los países en desarrollo y los menos adelantados sigan perdiendo vidas por falta de esta necesaria voluntad política. Yo quiero finalizar eh, valorando y agradeciendo este espacio que nos permite alzar la voz para pedir a las autoridades tomar con responsabilidad esta petición que abraza la oportunidad de alcanzar esta anhelada meta de llegar a una inmunización mayoritaria. Debemos tomar reacciones rápidas, decisiones rápidas, porque ¿qué pasa sin una posición clara? Demuestra el fracaso de estas construcciones internacionales. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias, eh, viceministro Blanco. Uh, y ahora, eh, eh, now we will turn to the next speaker, who is the uh, BioLease representative, John Fulton. Thank you, thank you. Pre appreciate uh, the invite today. And uh, <clears throat> uh, my name is John Fulton. I'm the president of BioNagra and also the spokesperson for BioLease Pharma Corporation, based in St. Catharines. Uh, and March of 2020, uh, during the early days of the pandemic, the government of Canada amended the Patent Act, allowing uh, Canadian manufacturers to produce uh, pretty much anything related, any kind of health technology related to COVID-19. Uh, they allowed Canadian companies to produce any, any patented drug, diagnostic device, medicine, Uh, uh, they quickly uh, amended the act uh, in a blink of an eye. It was, uh, I believe, at one cabinet meeting uh, within 24 hours, they amended, they amended the Patent Act. Yeah. And in 2005, uh, during the bird flu crisis, I attempted to do the same thing using Canada's access to medicines regime. We uh, attempted to uh, have the, ask the, our government to amend the Patent Act to add, co uh, add uh, uh, Tamiflu, Uh, the generic uh, ulcetamivir to the list of drugs uh, for export to, to uh, uh, low and middle income, middle income countries. Uh, that process took seven months after, uh, uh, after which uh, the bird flu uh, H5N1 virus had, had waned. Uh, there, uh, therefore, we, we didn't scale our production. Uh, let's, let's bring this up to date. Uh, this is a, a very technical topic. It's uh, the, the it's discussing the Patent Act and discussing Schedule One, the TRIPS waiver, the patent waiver. These are all uh, uh, complex uh, subjects for the general public. I'm going to bring us up to 2021. Over the last eight months, 
I've been trying to get the government of Canada just to start the conversation around amending the Patent Act to add COVID-19 vaccines and related technologies uh, for, for, uh, for low and middle income countries. So, so the contrast here is in, a, in, a, you know, in, a, in a one cabinet meeting, the Canadian government amended the act for Canadians, but they're not willing to do this for uh, low and middle income countries. And, I, and this is, uh, to me, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a shame. And uh, if you look at uh, the U.S. right now, uh, President Biden has uh, uh, put uh, support is supporting uh, the wave waiving uh, intellectual property for the production of, of vaccines. And here in Canada, we're still waiting just to to open open a dialogue to get the conversation started. I've been knocking at the uh, Justin Trudeau government's door for eight months now, and no one will give me a straight answer on how to trigger this process. <laughs> It's uh, the, that's my part. That's my <laughs> thank you very much, John. Uh, and now we will turn to a leading global voice on vaccine equity from KEI, uh, Luis Hill Abinader. Thank you, uh, MP Ashton. So, we are witnessing a disconnect between the message that Canada has been delivering to the international community and the actions of his own government at home. So at the World Trade Organization, Canada has been claiming that their access to medicine regime works, quote unquote, as intended. Canada has also been saying that this mechanism is the type of approach that should be used to address intellectual property barriers during the pandemic. Yet Canada refuses to take the steps required to trigger the access to medicine regime in the context of COVID-19. In particular, Canada refuses to add COVID-19 to schedule one of the Patent Act. By doing that, Canada is blocking the use of compulsory licenses to save lives in Bolivia. The way we see it, that is a remarkable act of hypocrisy. As, as Jung just mentioned, just surely before COVID-19 was declared a pandemic, Canada, uh, or after, surely after uh, COVID-19 was declared a pandemic, uh, Canada amended its patent law to facilitate the grant of compulsory licenses to supply its own market and to protect its own citizens. What we're calling for here today is for Canada to act with an urgency similar to the one used last year when it amended the Patent Act to protect uh, Canadians because saving lives in Bolivia is just as important as it is to save lives in Canada. I want to conclude by thanking MP Ashton and MP Davis and, and Vice Minister Blanco for your leadership on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. And uh, next we will turn to uh, uh, Nicolas. Um, uh, my name is Nicholas Barry Shaw. I'm the campaigner on trade and privatization with the uh, Council of Canadians. And um, I'm really glad that this uh, press conference has been organized. Uh, many thanks to Nikki Ashton's team for helping organize it and for, for all the speakers who have, who have uh, spoken so far. Um, you know, I would just start by saying that the pandemic has taught us many things. Um, but one of the things that it's really shown is unfortunately the, the global south can't depend on the generosity of wealthy countries like Canada or the benevolence of big pharma to ensure that they have access to life-saving medicines. Um, you know, since the vaccines uh, became readily available in December 2020, uh, the profiteering of the vaccine producers and the hoarding of doses by rich countries has meant that low-income countries have received only a tiny fraction of what they need to vaccinate their populations. The distribution of doses is so lopsided that the WHO calls it vaccine apartheid. Now, the problem is not manufacturing capacity. The manufacturing capacity is there to fix this situation if we can mobilize it. Uh, Biolize uh, Pharma is just one of many plants around the world that could be used to diversify uh, the supply of vaccines and make vaccines affordable and available to low-income countries. What's lacking, as Minister Blanco underlined, is the political will 
to take on big pharma. And unfortunately, for over a year now, that political will has been lacking in Canada. Um, the Council of Canadians has analyzed the lobbying records of these corporations, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, Innovative Medicines Canada, and we found that there has been a huge increase in lobbying by big pharma's lobbyists in Ottawa in the year since uh, the proposal to waive, temporarily waive patents on vaccines was made in October 2020. Um, over the past year, these uh, lobbyists for big pharma have met with the Trudeau government 181 times. Um, and this works out to an average of three to four meetings uh, per week. Now, prior to the pandemic, the Trudeau government would, um, the, well, the, the lobbyists for Big Pharma would complain that the Trudeau government uh, had a rather chilly relationship with them. And I think what we see in the lobbying records is that the, this relationship has warmed up considerably. One of the consequences of that is that Canada has been basically carrying water for Big Pharma at the WTO, and it has been blocking BioLees from, from completing this contract that it signed with the Bolivian government to produce a generic vaccine. Um, you know, Canada's refusal to act on the request of the Bolivian government to amend the, the Patent Act is uh, not only morally reprehensible, it's also dangerously short-sighted, epidemiologically speaking. So that's why the Council of Canadians, along with our allies, has launched a petition calling for the Trudeau government to get rid of this red tape to facilitate the production of generic vaccines in Canada and to support the temporary suspension of patents on COVID-19 vaccines and other life-saving medicines at the WTO. So with the help of our allies, we're hoping to build a grassroots response to Big Pharma's undue influence over our trade and vaccine policies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicholas, and thank you to all of our uh, very powerful speakers here today. You've heard clearly um, the message here today that we here in Canada, our government has the responsibility to act and to act urgently. Canada needs to stop the hypocrisy on the world stage. Solutions, including solutions here at home, are at our fingertips. And finally, as we all know, this is about saving lives and put an end, putting an end to a global pandemic that affects all of us. We welcome your questions uh, and further discussion. Thank you very much. So now we will invite members of the media. So I would like to invite only members of the media who have joined us today to ask a question and a follow up. To ask a question, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your page. Uh, there's either a raise hand function or a small menu called reactions where you can click and put your hand up. And when I call on you to ask your question, you can unmute yourself to ask your question to the speaker of your choosing. Alors, euh, j'aimerais ça inviter les membres des médias et uniquement les membres des médias qui sont avec nous aujourd'hui pour poser vos, que vos questions. Alors, ça sera une question, une question de suivi. Veuillez utiliser la fonction « Lever la main » qui est au bas de la page sous le menu « Réaction ». Et puis, euh, lorsque je vais vous appeler, vous pouvez vous enlever sur Sourzine pour poser votre question. So we have a question from David Thurton with the CBC. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for holding this press conference and doing it in so many languages. Um, I, I'm just wondering if this, this question is to the Bolivian foreign minister. I'm wondering, it, it's just so rare for uh, a diplomat, uh, a high ranking government official from another country to hold a press conference with an opposition party in Canada and to be so critical of the government. So I'm wondering if you can tell us, you know, what's to say about how frustrated or how serious or how acute the situation is in Bolivia? And maybe what are you hoping that the, the new Democrats will be able to do to, to help fix the situation, applying their pressure in parliament to effect change? Bueno, eh, me permito contestar la, la pregunta. Eh, esta conferencia de prensa eh, la estamos realizando no solamente 
con los diputados que, que gentilmente nos han apoyado para poder tener este espacio, sino también con eh, las, la propia empresa con la que hemos suscrito, con Biolice, que hemos suscrito un acuerdo. Eh, también con el KEI, que, que han sido los que nos han ayudado a poder encontrar una empresa que esté en la capacidad de poder producir las vacunas que se requieren. Eh, la posición de Bolivia sobre el tema de las, de las vacunas es que deberían ser un bien global, deberían ser para todos los, los, los países, sin importar si las personas viven en un país desarrollado o un país en desarrollo. Eh, es parte de la política exterior boliviana la defensa de la vida. Y es por eso que, los, que, que bueno, estamos presentes en esta conferencia para poder hacer escuchar nuestra voz y que prevalezca el derecho que tienen las personas a la vida sobre los eh, intereses que puede tener unas, un grupo de empresas transnacionales. Muchas gracias. I'll just ask a quick follow-up if I can, if I may, um, and maybe I'll direct this to uh, Ms. Ashton. Um, what pressure is the NDB gonna, gonna place on the government? Um, how are you gonna use the tools of parliament that you have at your disposal to, to change what we're doing? And, and I also just wonder, is it time to be using more stronger language? Like, uh, you know, not to sound incendiary or alarmist, but does, does Canada literally have blood on its hands? Uh, Well, first of all, I was uh, I want to start off by making it clear that uh, Bolivia and BioLise have been working at this for months uh, since March. In fact, uh, this is many months of, of uh, efforts to uh, meet with uh, representatives of the government of Canada, uh, meet with uh, diplomats, uh, and, uh, and and realize an agreement between uh, uh, you know a, a customer in the global south and a Canadian drug manufacturer. The fact that the government of Canada in the middle of a pandemic uh, chooses to continue to uh, pretend that it is a uh, you know a uh benevolent on the world stage and, and, and wanting to help uh, deal with this COVID-19 crisis, but doing the opposite here at home, uh, you know, needs to be uh, needs to be exposed, frankly, and, and we need to see change, right? This is, uh, we know this is, this is uh, the longer we fail to vaccinate folks and make vaccines available, the longer we will be dealing with COVID-19. So what we're saying here today is that it's time for the government of Canada to stop the hypocrisy, to stop the facade on the world stage, uh, and to allow for this deal between a Canadian company and a, 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 a country from, of the global south that is willing and, and uh, prepared to pay for vaccines to go forward. Um, we are certainly hoping that uh, the newly minted ministers, Minister Duclos and Minister Ng, along with the Prime Minister himself, uh, will uh, 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 look into this matter uh, immediately, uh, we'll uh, choose to, to uh, deal by, uh, uh, bilaterally with Bolivia in a respectful manner and other countries as well that are wishing to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, find solutions to access vaccines uh, and, uh, and to work as well to support a Canadian drug manufacturer. I mean, it is truly shocking that in the middle of a pandemic, we continue to see our Canadian government uh, cheerlead for big pharma instead of finding solutions uh, that that include solutions uh, uh, led by Canadian companies, uh, uh, you know, that that employ Canadians here on the ground that would benefit Canadian industry and Canadian communities. Uh, you know, this is a, an opportunity. This is a win win all around. And it's uh, and it's deeply needed during this this uh, at this time, uh, you know, in, in an urgent fashion, uh, uh, you know, we, we need to see Canada change course. And, uh, um, and I look forward to working with our team, Don Davies and our entire team in, uh, in pushing for Canada to act, uh, to, uh, to value life, uh, and to value uh, and, and to, to truly show leadership when it comes to uh, um, uh, making vaccines available on the world stage. Thank you very much. Just before I go to the next question, I just want to remind folks, uh, members of the media, if you would like to uh, ask a question, to please use the raise hand function at the bottom of the page. Uh, J'aimerais juste faire un rappel aux membres des médias si vous aimeriez poser 
vos questions, on vous inviterait d'utiliser la fonction « Lever la main » au bas de la page pour poser votre question et question de suivi. Next, I have Laura Osman with the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Thanks, Nina. Um, I don't mean to sound insensitive with this question because I'm, I'm genuinely interested to hear what you have to say. Perhaps this is best directed at the MPs. Um, I can imagine that the government is nervous about going out on a limb and being the only country to sort of use this flexibility to waive intellectual property rights, which could uh, anger some of the companies that, whose innovation we're counting on uh, domestically in this pandemic. Do you have any concern that while we're still relying on doses from these pharmaceutical companies, that um, this move could have an adverse effect on Canada's own vaccine rollout? Maybe I'll uh, answer that, uh, Nikki, if that's okay. Uh, well, first of all, I think that's called leadership. Uh, we are in extraordinary times right now. I mean, let's face it, uh, it's, this happens uh, once every hundred years where we have such a serious, significant, widespread global pandemic. And I think the normal rules of business that are meant to govern uh, the production of goods and, and services in normal regular times ought to be examined uh, very carefully and, and measured as to whether or not they're appropriately applied in, in such an extraordinary time as this. Um, you know, we in the NDP, and I think, I think uh, responsible leaders all over the world believe in, in ordered, uh, you know, regulated trade uh, rules for everybody. But there are certain times and I think imperatives that, that trump that. And I think the health of the global population where life is literally on, on the, uh, in hanging in the balance is one of those. Um, so we're talking about a responsible, judicious, sensible, targeted relaxation of patent rules for the purpose of facilitating the production of life-saving vaccines. That's what we're talking about here. And I think that's not only a responsible position, I think it's the only ethical, and frankly, it's the only pragmatic decision. I don't know how many times we have to emphasize that this virus does not know borders. What happens in Bolivia, what happens in Canada, what happens in Africa, what happens in Europe or Asia affects us all. And we all have a, if not a moral interest, we have a self-interest in making sure that every human being is vaccinated as quickly as possible. And to slavishly apply corporate rules uh, and use those, allow them to be used as barriers that are palpably and demonstrably working to prevent the vaccination of humans in a time of of, of uh, death-causing pandemic is, uh, I think, unjustifiable. And so to me, the only responsible position of any political leader anywhere would be to do everything possible to facilitate the production, the distribution, and the vaccination of, of citizens, no matter where they live on this planet. And as we approach the two-year mark since uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, emerged on the on the global stage. I think that the the world leaders have had more than enough time to understand the issues and to make those changes. And I think uh, what's very very regrettable is we're seeing leaders around the world, including our own government here, the government of, Tru uh, of Justin Trudeau, who appear to be uh, not willing to to take on pharmaceutical industry interests, even when that puts the health uh, of Canadians and, and citizens at risk. I'm going to end by emphasizing again, um, as significant, in fact, in some cases, most, in some cases, all of the investment that went into the research and development of these vaccines was paid for by the public. This is not a case where you had pharmaceutical companies who risked their capital and spent years in development and, and have a strong case for private manipulation 
or monopolization of, pro of profit to dominate in this case here. I think Moderna is a case where 100% of the, um, of the uh, R&D was paid for by the public. I know that Pfizer's German partner got, I think it was half a billion dollars. Um, so the public has paid for these vaccines. I think the public should get the benefit of it. So, so I, I, and by the way, I think that the Canadian public and the citizens of countries around the world would agree with this position. Thank you so much, Don. Um, I also had a question for uh, John. I was wondering, once you get this approval, if it eventually comes in, what are the steps that follow and how long would it take to be actually be able to start producing and exporting uh, some vaccine? Thank you, Laura. <clears throat> First of all, uh, adding COVID-19 vaccines to Schedule One of the Patent Act uh, is, the, is the first step uh, that will allow us to uh, move on to requesting a compulsory license. So as far as I know, the only requirement to uh, Get, adding a drug to Schedule One of the Patent Act is that it be a patented drug. Uh, in, in 2003, when the when Canada's access to medicines regime uh, came into force, there was already 45 drugs on this on the list of drugs, and uh, I don't believe there were any uh, generic manufacturers of drugs set up to produce any of any of those drugs. So uh, what we we we're doing now is we're asking that COVID-19 vaccines as a category uh, and related uh, health technologies be added to this list. Once the, they're on the list, then we can, we can look at the uh, investment in, in fully setting up manufacturing, uh, look at tech transfer, look at the funding. Uh, but until then, until the COVID-19 vaccines are on, on that list, we run the risk of, of, of uh, this investment without the opportunity to be able to get a, get a compulsory license. Now to answer your question, uh, how long this would take, uh, I'd like to go back to uh, April, 2020, when uh, Bialis Pharma, which uh, uh, so you know, is one of three uh, companies that we know of in Canada that, are, that, are, that is a industrial level, uh, GMP, GLP, Sterilfil injectable drug manufacturer. This is it's a big it's a big facility. It's 125,000 square feet. They currently produce uh, injectable cancer drugs that they're shipped all over the world. Many of their customers are in, are in low income countries. Uh, so, Biolis early uh, early in the pand pandemic was was contacted by Deloitte on behalf of the Canadian government to uh, investigate uh, whether or not they could produce vaccines for the pandemic. <clears throat> and, and what they what Deloitte discovered was that Biolise was four years into building a facility to produce biologics. All the, uh, the bioreactors, the fill, fill lines, the uh, laboratories, the, the air handling systems, the water systems were all uh, on site or in place. And uh, they, they actually thought they struck gold. There was a facility that ex existed here uh, and uh, was in, in the process of, uh, of scaling to produce uh, biologics, or bio, in this case, biosimilars. And the, so to, to, again, to answer your question, we're looking at four to six months to finish scaling and to get into production. Uh, now, that being said, let's just say we, we, got a, we did get, receive a compulsory license to produce the uh, J&J vaccine. We would need some collaboration from J and J to make this happen in a, a a time that is really relative to the crisis at hand, because in Canada, uh, bio biosimilars, uh, let's just say that the biosimilar being the generic version of a of a biologic drug, they're treated as new drugs uh, 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 compared to say let's say uh, uh, the current drugs that the company's making if they if they produce a generic copy of a, of of a uh, patented drug. Then there's only uh, the uh, bioequivalency that they have to, have to establish. Whereas with a, uh, a generic vaccine or generic uh, biosimilar, you have to go through go through clinical trials. Now, to avoid clinical trials, you would have to be working very closely 
with the patent holder, in this case, J&J. &J. And uh, that's really what we look forward to is, is that, that, that collaboration that would allow us to, to produce these vaccines very quickly and address uh, the member, the, the uh, agreement we have with Bolivia. Sorry, can I just clarify, if you get the compulsory license, does j, &J have to cooperate with you? A, a, a compulsory license is really only uh, 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 a device that protects you from litigation. It doesn't, it doesn't force tech transfer. It doesn't force uh, the sharing of, of, of cell lines or, or knowledge or tricks of the trade. It, it basically protects us from being sued. If you go back to 2005, uh, when during the bird flu crisis, we were, uh, we, we, had, we got Tamiflu or also Tamivir, the generic name, on the list of drugs. They amended, they amended the patent act, added, added it to the list of drugs. In the meantime, we had uh, reverse engineered Tamiflu. Uh, one, of the, one of the big issues of, around making Tamiflu was having the, the uh, uh, reagents uh, or the, the biomass for, for to produce the API. We, we actually uh, figured out a way to extract uh, shikimic acid, the main ingredient from, from pine trees. So we secured the biomass, we reverse engineered it. Now, keep in mind, we didn't produce, we didn't, uh, produce any of that data for the government of Canada at that time. All we did was through our member of parliament, ask that uh, Tamiflu be added to the list of drugs and the process started. Now, eight months into, in eight months into the, uh, the process this time around, uh, I started asking March uh, 20, 2021, actually I, I called the main number on the Canada's Access to Medicines uh, uh, website, uh, Canada's Access to Medicines regime's web website and it was disconnected, it remains disconnected. Uh, then I went to the list of drugs on Schedule One to see see if had had been, been already been amended for or for COVID nineteen vaccines, and the link was broken. So to this day, uh, right here and now, if you go to the to the camera website, the main phone number is disconnected, and the links to these uh, these uh, scheduled list of drugs is is, is not found. So I, I find that uh, abhorrent that that the website has been is gone dormant and. Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're as a group here today, we're, we're trying to resurrect this, this, this program, trying to get uh, Canada's access to the medicines regime back on its feet and, uh, and uh, put it to use. This is what it's for. If, if you know, we can't use CAMR, we can't use uh, compulsory licensing for a worldwide uh, pandemic that's uh, uh, killing millions of millions of people, then, then what, what's the use? And, and really, uh, to quote uh, a representative from uh, MSF uh, that I had a meeting with, she said that if, you know if we can't if we can't get a compulsory licensing system running for during a, a pandemic. We can't get ish, get compulsory licenses issued. We don't have any hope for global warming. We're putting we're putting uh, the lives of marginalized uh, peoples in, in low income parts of the world, low and middle income areas of the world, at risk by not allowing companies like BioLease or like Incepta in Bangladesh. Uh, I've been in touch with the, the, the president of uh, Incepta in Bangladesh. He has 20,000 people working for him and his, his equipment's sitting idle. There's uh, Teva, there's uh, Northern Biotech. There's, there's four companies right there that are ready to start producing uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccines. And there's many, many more on the sidelines that would, uh, would volunteer to uh, produce if the optics changed, if if we, you know, if uh, the the WTO members get uh, get a consensus and, and and acknowledge that we have a problem, uh, these I think these uh, the resistance that we're we're getting from the Trudeau government uh, would would, uh, would would it would push through. They 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 start a conversation. I'm really only looking to start a conversation. If I go to Health Canada, they're very forthcoming. It's just you have to speak to. Industry Canada, or I said, Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada, and, and get on Schedule One. You can't, we can't, you can't talk to us until you're on Schedule One. If you talk, if you talk to I said, they direct you back to Health Canada. So it's a classic catch twenty two. Thank you very much. So we're just going to go to our last question. Uh, I have Camille from Quebec. Please go ahead with one question, one follow up. Thank you. Hello, how are you? Well, my name is Camille Stachnoy. I'm, I'm from TELAM, the National News Agency of, of Argentina. 
Uh, first of all, well, thank you for organizing this press conference, which I think it's it's very important because it shows that this pandemic is far from over, especially here in the in the global south. Uh, if it's okay with you, like this is an international matter, I, I will speak in Spanish, uh, considering also that we have a, a translator. So my, my questions, there are only two questions that I have. Uh, one is uh, from, for una pregunta es para Nikki Ashton, I will start speaking in Spanish. Una pregunta es para Nikki Ashton y otra es para el viceministro Blanco. Eh, sabemos que hasta ahora Violis no obtuvo nada más que silencio del gobierno de Canadá en su pedido para, para incluir las vacunas al, al Schedule One. En ese sentido, mi pregunta es para Nikki Ashton es ¿qué le responden los miembros del eh, oficialismo, del parlamento del oficialismo ante sus demandas de alguna respuesta? Y consular, consultarle también al, al embajador, al, al viceministro Blanco, ¿qué, ¿qué le dice el embajador de Canadá en Bolivia o con las autoridades que ha, haya hablado? Eh, teniendo en cuenta que, como lo señaló eh, Luis Gil Abinader, esta, esta accionar del gobierno de Canadá, en este caso en particular, se contradice con su posición en la Organización Mundial del Comercio, donde no apoya el, el TRIPS Waiver, eh, sino que la contrapropuesta, digamos, que prioriza justamente eh, mantener las actuales eh, previsiones de, de licencias obligatorias. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Camille. I will answer in, in English, uh, um, uh, even though I understood uh, your question. Uh, first, I want to say to your introduction, it is absolutely shameful uh, that, uh, <laughs> that, that Canada is not moving on, uh, on this, this uh, life and death matter, matter of uh, producing vaccines uh, to, uh, to assist the global south, the, uh, pr uh, the production of which uh, would, uh, would benefit here our, uh, our own country. Um, so this is, uh, you know, and this is months in the making, it is time for Canada to act. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our, we, we finally know what uh, our cabinet will look like. We know that we have a new Minister of Health, a new Minister of, of uh, Industry, uh, and uh, um, they were announced just a few days ago. Uh, so what we, are, what we are saying today, we are appealing to them. We are also appealing to Prime Minister Trudeau and calling on them to act, to grant this compulsory license, to allow for this agreement between uh, BioLease and Bolivia to uh, become reality. Uh, I look forward to working with our team, uh, Don Davies, my colleague, and our team in Parliament as it reopens at the end of this month and beyond to push Canada to act. You know, we, we have uh, we've seen our Prime Minister talk a good talk on the world stage, uh, but the reality is that Canada is part of the problem, both at the international level and here at home, not allowing a deal like this to go forward. Uh, there is no good reason for this to take place. Uh, we We've seen that Canada take the side of big pharmaceutical companies. Look, the bottom line here is saving lives. What we need to do is allow for Canada to be part of the solution. Uh, and in dealing with the global 19 pandemic, whether it's in the whether it's here or the global south or around the world, and allowing for this this agreement to go forward is that solution. We are calling on Canada to act today, now. Para, para contestar la, la pregunta eh, que, que nos hacía el compañero de, de Telam es eh, sobre la, la relación que hemos estado teniendo con la embajada y con el propio gobierno de Canadá eh, desde el principio, desde marzo, abril, cuando firmamos el acuerdo también, hemos estado sosteniendo reuniones. En Bolivia no tenemos una embajada de Canadá, la embajada que atiende a Bolivia es concurrente en, en Perú, pero hemos tenido la oportunidad de tener algunas videoconferencias. También hemos hecho la solicitud de manera oficial utilizando los canales diplomáticos correspondientes. Sin embargo, la, uni, la única respuesta es que el tema está en análisis y que cuando se tenga algún, alguna respuesta, algún avance, se nos comunicaría. De momento y por estos ya varios, varios meses no hemos recibido ninguna respuesta adicional.
Camille, do you have a follow up? No, no, thank you. Thank you so much both for, for the answer. Muchas gracias a los dos por, por sus respuestas. Excellent. Uh, we will. We have time for one last question. Uh, if we can go to uh, Christian Rojas, if you can tell us from what media you are, uh, we have the time for one more question. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Please go ahead. You can ask your question. Mm. All right, I think we have some technical difficulties. So I believe that this will have to conclude our press conference. Ceci mettra fin à notre conférence de presse. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Bonne journée. Have a good day.